Welcome everybody to our webinar to this morning about EU DataVis. We are very happy to have Andreas Grefsgaard with us as part of our series. And as always, I would like to uh, ask you to mute yourself and to stop video sharing that we have a good connection. This video will be recorded and will be available later also on YouTube. So with no further ado, I would like to give the floor to Andreas. Thanks so much, Simon, and thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Andreas Rivsgaard, and I'll talk about playful machine learning for the next a bit less than an hour. Maybe we have then time for a few questions. Um, so um, a bit about me. I'm an interaction designer and creative coder from uh, Denmark, and I like to work with uh, algorithms, uh, computers, and um, artificial intelligence, machine learning in very weird ways. Um, in my everyday life, I kind of do four things. So I do a lot of artistic work with these tools, and that's mainly what I'll talk about in this talk. I also do a lot of public speaking. I do a lot of uh, workshops where I teach students and companies about some of these techniques. And then finally, I do quite a bit of freelance work, but I'll mainly focus on the artistic side of my practice here today. Um, and a lot of my work deals with unconventional connections between inputs and outputs. And what does that mean? It means that I kind of use something to control something else via the computer. Um, and one example of that is from back when I was a student, I studied interaction design. And uh, for my final project, I built this uh, tool called iConductor, which is a tool that allows people to play music using their eyes and their face as inputs. Um, so a very unconventional input for playing music. And I'll show this uh, video that kind of explains a bit about the project. It's a musical instrument for people with physical disabilities that allows them to play by only using their eyes uh, and facial gestures. This is a sequencer where if I look at one point for two seconds, then I insert a beat. So this was a student project I did when I studied at Copenhagen Institute of Interaction Design back in 2015. And in a lot of ways, this project actually got me really interested in machine learning. Because when I made this project, I relied a lot on face tracking and eye tracking. And I found out that these techniques were powered by machine learning. But for me, coming from design, not really having a super technical background, I feel, felt a bit overwhelmed uh, in the beginning. And uh, I think artists and designers, and maybe also other professions, feel quite overwhelmed when they start digging into machine learning because it can be a very technical field with lots of equations and lots of code and lots of statistics. And sometimes it can be a bit tricky to get started with. Luckily, I found some tools that actually helped me just build things because I'm a designer and artist and I like to build things. Um, and I stumbled across this tool called Wikinator, which really helped me uh, back then. Um, so Wikinator is this tool that you can use where you just send it raw streams of data. It could be something like the position of your hand, if you have a tracker that can track your hand. Um, and then you can uh, use a graphical interface to do all the machine learning for you. So in this short video, I am demonstrating how I teach the system to recognize, distinguish, and classify hand gestures, me doing uh, rock, me doing paper, and me doing scissors without a, a lot of coding, just simply by example, by showing um, the system what I mean by hand, uh, sorry, by rock, um, paper, and scissors. 
And then I have the paper. For some of those. And finally the scissors. Record some of those. And then I can train and I can run. So we have the scissors, rock, paper, rock, scissors, rock, paper. So for me as an interaction designer, it was super interesting to start to have these tools where I could use supervised machine learning um, instead of having to program everything from scratch. It meant that I could kind of prototype without coding too much. I could go through cycles of iteration a lot faster. I could even let users train and decide what the interactions would be because they weren't necessarily defined in code, but they were a result of somebody uh, feeding training data to a system. And then I could use very complicated inputs such as raw streams of video or maybe raw streams of audio, which can be kind of uh, tricky to deal with if you're not a very skilled programmer. And I started doing a lot of small experiments with these techniques and that caught the attention from Google Creative Lab in New York. So they asked me and uh, another guy, another interaction designer I was working with at the time, a Danish guy called Lasse Korskog, they asked us to help them build a tool that could kind of um, um, yeah, help people try out machine learning directly in a web browser. Uh, and the tool was called Teachable Machine, where you can train a machine uh, using your camera directly in the browser. And I'll actually demonstrate it. Um, so now there's two versions of Teachable Machine. I was only part of making the old version, so I'm going to show you the old version. Um, it's online. And uh, the whole idea is that you can um, have an input, which is the webcam feed. Um, then you have a learning part uh, where you can teach the system about three different things, a green thing, a purple thing, and an orange thing. The colors don't really mean anything. It's just to make it kind of playful. Um, and then finally, you can have an output. And in my case, I think I will try to see if I can teach the system to distinguish between me an orange and a cup of coffee. So those, these are just the things I have in front of me. Um, so I think I will be the green class. Then the, uh, let's see, the coffee should be the purple class. And then the orange, of course, the orange class. And then I can have it output something. So you can have it output very silly things like GIFs or sounds or speech. And I think I will, uh, for me, it should do something. I'm from Denmark. So let's see if we have some silly GIFs from Denmark. We have, uh, I don't know, Danish football fans. Yes, Danish football fans. So if it sees me, it should associate me with Danish football fans. If it sees the, uh, the coffee cup, it should do something related to coffee. Um, this one is kind of cute. So this will be the coffee. And then finally, the orange. Let's see if we have an orange. We have an orange here. OK. so. I will try to see if I can really quickly train the system to distinguish between these three things. Me, a cup of coffee, and an orange. And of course, this is a very, very uh, crude uh, demo. It will see lots of things in the background, but it's just to prove a point um, and to make a simple uh, little experience. So uh, I'll try to give it some examples of the green class, which will be associated with me, which will then in the end show Danish football fans. Um, and I will start recording. So when I click the button, I actually record small snapshots of myself. That will be the training data associated with the green class. And I'll give it a few examples. I'll try to give it a bit of variation so it knows that it's me, even if I'm leaning forward or leaning backwards. OK, so now it's really sure about me. And it associates this, uh, what it sees right now uh, in the input with uh, the Danish football fans. However, if I move away, or if I show it something else, it still thinks that it's the green class. I haven't taught it about anything else. So I need to teach it about multiple things in order for it to be able to distinguish between those things. So for the coffee cup, I'm gonna put it in front of the camera and record roughly as many examples. And now it should be able to distinguish coffee cup from the Danish football fan. And then we'll do the same thing with the orange. There we go. So we got orange, we got football fan, and we got the coffee cup. Okay. 
Um, yeah, everybody can try this teachable machine with google.com and I was part of making version one. If you go to it without v1, you'll get to a new version, which can actually do even more cool stuff. Um, but yeah, I was only part of making the first version. Um, so we put this uh, tool online and a lot of people started making fun um, experiments with it. Um, here is a tweet from Baron Repster. He was actually also involved in the project and he used it to make a, a kind of like a, a joke uh, about a TV series called Silicon Valley. Maybe some of you seen it, maybe you haven't, but there's a, this joke about uh, somebody who makes a, a machine learning uh, system that can uh, classify whether something is a hot dog or not a hot dog. And he tried to do the same thing. So let's just have a look at this video. Not hot dog. Not hot dog. Hot dog. Not hot dog. Hot dog. Not hot dog. Not hot dog. 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 So <laughs> look how happy he is. Uh, so even though you could argue that what he's doing is maybe a, a bit silly uh, and is not necessarily the most robust classifier in the world, but the cool thing about projects like this, and, and I think maybe also to some extent an overlooked uh, uh, capability of, of uh, machine learning, supervised machine learning, is the fact that you can have things that users can train themselves and you, users can define what are the inputs and what are the the interactions all about. And for instance, here, I think Baron spent three minutes on this and, and it kind of proves his point. And for an interaction designer, it's very nice to be able to prove points very, very quickly and show them to users and then iterate from there. Okay. Um, so this was Teachable Machine version one, if you want to check it out. Um, I'm going to show some uh, more projects, some kind of slightly more advanced projects in a sense, but built on uh, exactly the same idea of training systems to classify something. And then in this case, uh, what is built on top of it is a musical interface. So um, the project I'm going to show here is called Doodle Tunes. It was made in 2016 in collaboration with an American artist named Gene Kogan um, for a hackathon in South Korea. Um, and we trained a system to recognize simple drawings of musical instruments. And then a user could come in front of a camera with a regular uh, marker uh, and then draw musical instruments on paper. If they did so, then uh, those uh, drawings would be classified as uh, bass guitar, drum, um, saxophone, and piano. And then you could actually compose music with those instruments you drew um, simply by drawing them on paper. <laughs> Fun thing happened uh, about a year later, uh, Gene and I, who built this tool, we uh, posted it online and put all the source code on GitHub so people could kind of remix it. And we even made a version without the sound output so people could maybe build another output. And that's actually what happened. Uh, but it was, uh, yes, typically we just show it to students and then students uh, build something on top of it. But in this case, a very large company built something on top of it, uh, Airbnb. Um, and the video I'm going to show is from a blog post they did um, where they had a, a very neat idea. Um, and you see our tool on the right. 
Um, but then on the left, they made a, a tool that would uh, do um, a mobile app. So you go from sketches on paper, which is something you typically do if you're an interaction designer, you kind of sketch out just really quickly where should different elements be on a mobile web page um, or a, a regular web page. But then uh, typically you then have to put it into Photoshop and then afterwards you need to have a developer work on it. And here they kind of try to see, okay, can we actually go from sketches on paper to real code? The, the content uh, is of course, kind of still lorem ipsum, like uh, mock-up uh, images and, and kind of um, generic uh, text and generic headlines, but it kind of proves an interesting idea. So it's interesting to see how these techniques, even though I use them for very silly things, they can actually be used for quite productive things. Um, that's, that's interesting. It's also interesting to see how sometimes uh, artists can become the unpaid research and development of uh, big companies. Um, so as I said, these techniques can be used for very meaningful things, also for very scary things. Most of the time, what I like to do is just to make very, very silly things. And that's also what this next project is about. It's called, Is It Funky? And it's an installation that tries to determine what is funky and what is boring. Um, the idea is that you um, can search for whatever you want on uh, Google image search, and then you will get small thumbnails. Those are the images you see up here with prints. And then you can click all of the thumbnails and then a classifier will determine whether they are funky or whether they're boring. And you could argue that that's like very absurd or highly subjective, like what is funky and what is boring is, is, is a matter of taste. But machine learning algorithms are increasingly moving into quite subjective territory. It's not only about whether something is like objectively a cat or objectively a dog, it's also about whether something is beautiful or whether something is appropriate or things that are a bit more of a gray zone. So I thought it was interesting to make an experiment. So I just trained this thing with my own taste in images. What I thought were interesting images, funky images, and what I thought were boring images. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the upper left part of it. Then down here, you have a small screen with some people dancing and you have a funk score. And it, the whole thing also played back music. It was an installation in Berlin. So the more funky stuff you show it, the better the music will be and the better the graphics will be. But if you start to show it boring stuff, a lot of really, really boring images, and we'll see examples of boring images, um, then the music will be more glitchy, more slow. The graphics will start to distort and you will not have like a really funky time. Okay. So let's have a, have a look at it. The prince was funky. And you can search for new things. And you can try to guess at home if you think it's funky or boring. No. Ooh, okay, so taxes. Do you think taxes are funky or boring? And here are some of the here are some of the images it's have been trained on for boring. So it thinks that politicians and porridge and and stuff like that is boring. And here's some of the funky stuff. So it really likes colorful things, rocks, teletubbies, uh, graffiti music. Okay, um, I, I'll move on to kind of a new uh, input method, um, but still related to playful machine learning. Um, so what I've shown you so far is a lot of things related to video inputs or image inputs, um, but you can do machine learning stuff on all types of input data. 
And in the next uh, experiments, I'm going to show sound as an input, but sound is a bit of an uh, unconventional input method. Um, so in, uh, I, I was working with this guy you see on the left, Lasse Korsko, and uh, me and him were very interested in playing games with weird sounds. Um, so we tried to train uh, sound classifiers to classify small sounds we made. It could be the sound of whistling or the sound of clapping, something like that. Um, and then we started playing simple games with those uh, types of inputs. Um, so let's have a look. So uh, this was our first test, very, very fast. Um, and we thought it, that it was a kind of interesting uh, way of interacting, um, but maybe it was a bit too simple. So we did another test um, where instead of having a game where you can only do one thing, only jump, we tried to play a classic game. And maybe some of you know this game. It's uh, called Sound Controlled, uh, or sorry, the game is called Wolfenstein's 3D. It's a classic first person shooter. Um, and in this game, you can do multiple things. You can move forward, you can move to the sides, you can open doors and you can shoot. So that's a lot of uh, things that you would typically control with, um, with a keyboard or with a mouse or maybe with a joystick. Um, but in this case, we control it with very silly sounds. So we trained the classifier to classify, I think five, five different sounds. Uh, and then we map those sounds to different keystrokes. Um, and of course we could do something like left, if you say the word left, you go left or right, you say the word right and you go right. But we we did very, very silly sounds instead, which makes the game, in my opinion, a bit more interesting, but also a bit uh, more uh, confusing. Um, so let's have a look. <laughs> that was a very, very hard uh, game to play. Um, I'll show a non-interactive work. Um, this, this piece is called an algorithm watching a movie trailer. Uh, the movie trailer is for uh, the Hollywood film, The Wolf of Wall Street. And the algorithm is an algorithm called uh, YOLO. It's an algorithm that's able to uh, detect multiple objects in images. Um, this was a project from 2017. And these algorithms keep improving. So this one made quite a few uh, little mistakes. For instance, you see that it thinks that this guy has a cell phone on top of his uh, beard. Um, yeah. so the idea behind this project was to try to see a piece of popular culture from the perspective of an algorithm, because this algorithm is impressive. It can detect a lot of things, but there's also a lot of objects, uh, a lot of surfaces, etc., that it doesn't really know anything about. So what I did was I deleted all the uh, parts it didn't know anything about um, and then only left the objects that it could recognize. And what you'll see now is then an alternative version of the movie trailer, but seen through the perspective of this algorithm. <laughs> Year I turned 26, I made $49 million, which really pissed me off because it was three shy of a million a week. <laughs> We're making a name for ourselves. <laughs> Nobody knows if the stock is going to go up, down, sideways, or in circles. You know what Fugazi is? <clears throat> Fugazi. It's a fake. Fugazi. It's a wazi. It's a woozy. It's a 
fairy dust. <laughs> was all this legal? Absolutely not. You were making more money than we knew what to do with. We're going to work for you, man. Well, yeah, my money takes you, Bruce. Take your leave to work for me. <laughs> FBI, any kind of booze you might want. No. The bureau for this is drinking. So follow me up to the top the door. I'm doing 500, I'm out of control. They stick. This is their gift, okay? They're built to be thrown like a lawn dart. One, two, Stop. Then we also made a version. Um, I, I need to say this uh, project was made in collaboration with Lasse Korsko, uh, who you saw whistling before. Um, um, we also made a version that would censor uh, everything that was being recognized, so auto automatic censorship of all entities being recognized. And then finally, a very abstract version showing only the bounding boxes. Um, so yeah, I'm really interested in in uh, computer vision, what machines see, but typically I also want to build something on top of it. Uh, and that's what this next project is about. It's a project called Poems About Things. And it's a project that tries to generate poetry from everyday objects uh, that are around us. Um, and um, the whole idea is that I have a, um, I build it as a mobile website. So, um, so, um, people can use their camera on their mobile phone and focus on objects. And then a built in machine learning model will try to guess what it's seeing. And then that guess is sent to uh, Google suggest API, which returns one or more sentences inspired by the detector, the detected object. So it's the same technique as if you try to search for something and Google or another search engine will auto complete your search query. So in this case, it thinks bananas and then can bananas all types of questions with can bananas. Um, here it thinks that this is a laptop and then all types of questions related to laptop or sentences. Um, an organ, uh, but organ can have multiple meanings. So organ failure, organizational structure, etc. Refrigerators, uh, all types of things. Um, I'm going to pick out two of my favorites from this project. Um, bananas. <laughs> um, I don't think bananas can kill you uh, normally, at least. But from this project, I actually learned that banana trees can move. So in a way, I also see this project as an example of something where where I try to make everyday objects a bit more strange. Like a, a banana is something you take for granted, but if you like, if you uh, look at the banana and then uh, have the whole kind of collective consciousness of the internet, which Google autocomplete to some extent is, um, then you get all of these weird questions about the objects that you would never have thought about. And I learned, for instance, that the roots of a banana tree can move almost up to a meter during its lifespan. So banana trees can, to some extent, actually move. I don't know what I'm going to use that information for, but yeah. Um, and then another thing that's interesting about the project is also when the classifications are wrong. Because with these machine learning um, uh, image classification tasks, typically, uh, oftentimes, uh, the algorithms make mistakes. And if you work in uh, healthcare or if you work in law or if you work with engineering, then you don't want these mistakes. Um, but as a as an artist, I'm kind of interested and fascinated in these mistakes. Um, and this next image um, shows one of these mistakes. It's a, a student. Uh, I have his permission to use this image. Uh, but he was very interested in we did a workshop in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And he was very interested in what types of poems would be written about his body. But this uh, machine learning algorithm that I used to classify images was not trained specifically to recognize uh, parts of bodies. It was only trained to recognize objects. So it thought that his very beautiful but somewhat hairy chest was a fur coat. And you could say that that's, that's, like, that that's wrong. It's not a fur coat. But out of the classes it was able to uh, guess, then fur coat is a pretty good guess. And maybe in a symbolic way, 
uh, a hairy chest is a human's fur coat. And then it starts asking a lot of questions about fur coat. So is my fur coat real? Is my fur coat wor worth anything? Is my fur coat mink, which now is even more relevant, especially in Denmark with the whole COVID mink uh, scandal where we had to kill all the Danish minks uh, for fur. Uh, is my coat fur? And then the final question, why is my fur coat shedding? I hope he's not shedding in, in real life. So yeah, all of these weird questions, sentences, and small poems about uh, objects detected, whether they are correctly classified or not. And it's actually a project you can try yourself if you go to my website, which is just my name.dk. I'll also put it in the end of my talk. And then poems about things. If you click that project, you can try the uh, demo out yourself. Um, okay. I am also interested in trying to make computers generate even more coherent stories because like poems or small lines of sentences that uh, is somewhat easy to make it coherent, but it's way more tricky to make fully coherent text that is computer generated. But with the uh, advances in technology from companies like OpenAI, where they, for instance, made the, now the GPT-3, which is really, really good at, at writing, um, you can to some extent actually make computers write quite quite decent text, especially in the languages that it's trained on, um, in this case, English. Um, so what I tried to do here was in a way a bit of a continuation of the last project. Um, I still use images as my input. So you see, for instance, here that there's an image where three things are detected. There's a person, there's a keyboard, and there's a TV monitor. Um, and then I try to generate fairy tales about these three very ordinary objects. I also did it for other things. So here's a toilet, and then it generates the story of the toilet. If the classified thing was a suitcase, of course, it becomes the story of the suitcase. And then I um, start the uh, fairy tale with a very typical beginning, and that's something that I wrote myself. And it's a typical uh, beginning, like in a land far, far away, or once upon a time, something like that. Um, but then after that, uh, I use the title, and I use the first sentence as, as a prompt uh, to a text generation algorithm that will then continue my text. So I'm going to read this one out loud, and I'll say what I sort of wrote and what the uh, algorithm uh, generated itself. The story of the toilet. In a land far, far away, once lived the toilet. One day, and after this uh, comma, I didn't write anything. The algorithm uh, produced the rest. A servant came to help clean it. Before he could start, the whole thing sprang up into a dragon. He returned home at once. A year later, he was summoned back to the same place where he found it was still a toilet, but more powerful. He found it that too much waste in the toilet caused an explosion, killing the whole thing. So, of course, this is a very absurd fairy tale, but nonetheless, I forced an algorithm to write a fairy tale style uh, text about a very non magical object, a toilet. Um, and I'll read one more out loud. Uh, I, in, in total, I produced 800 of these. Um, with GPT-3, they would be quite a bit better. This was made with GPT-2 uh, and something called XLNet. Um, I'll read this one out loud, which almost goes in a loop which sometimes happens with these machine learning um, text generators that they cannot just go into a weird loop. It almost like doesn't make sense, but but the loop that it still makes um, creates a nice rhythmical structure. So I'm going to read this one out loud. And the object detected is a clock. So of course, it becomes the story of the clock. In a land far, far away, once lived a clock. The fabulous story began and then after began, I didn't write anything. It's the algorithm continuing my text. The fabulous story began when the clock ran out of candles, when the clock ran out of time, when the clock ran out of service. It was a lonely time for the clock. The clock went out of clock hands. The clock went out of candle oil. The clock went out of power. The clock went out of service. The clock went out of business. The clock went out of worship. The clock went out of friendship. The clock went out of love. Okay, so maybe you think that 
all of this is very, very silly, but now it's going to get even more silly because I took some of these techniques and I actually created a bookstore, which is called Books by AI. And you can actually visit it now. Books by and then dot AI is an online bookstore that tries to sell science fiction um, uh, books, full books that you can actually buy uh, printed out. Um, and um, um, it's not only the text in the book that is generated, it's also the covers of the books, it's the titles of the books, and it's the um, author names. Um, also, the prices are, the, are generated and the descriptions of the books are also generated. Um, and it's been trained on a lot of training data from Project Gutenberg, which is open source. And then we scraped Amazon.com, um, which is not open source. And then for the book covers, we trained something called a GAN model with images of existing uh, covers from science fiction books from Open Library, which is also an open source um, website. Um, yeah, so it can, once you then train it, it can generate infinite number of books. However, the books are not super great, to be honest. So we needed to sell these books. How do you sell books now? Uh, days you need social proof. Um, and then we generated lots of people that don't exist. And we had them uh, write reviews on books based on existing positive reviews from Amazon. So you could argue that this project is a bit of a spam project in a sense. Uh, these are some of the shorter reviews. They also made lots of long reviews. Um, and then we tried to kind of like not really mess too much with the content. So of course we picked the book covers we liked, we picked the titles we liked, but we didn't change anything. We never photoshopped anything. We never changed any of the words. We just kind of curated the content. Um, um, it took quite a, a lot of time to train and this was back in 2018. So nowadays you could do it with better results and you could do it in a short amount of time. Um, but yeah, it was an early attempt. And now these books are actually for sale on Amazon, which is a bit of a weird thing because a lot of the training data comes from Amazon. So in a way, it's a bit of a snake biting itself in the tail. It's also a comment on the fact that surveys show that quite a lot of stuff on Amazon, especially the, um, the comments are actually computer generated. It's not, um, I think up to like 25, 30% of comments are robot comments. So it's not actually human people uh, um, reviewing uh, things. So yeah, Books by AI, you can visit it. It's made in collaboration with uh, Danish data scientist, Mikkel Tsubolose. Um, the, the books are not that great, but the reviews are really good. Um, okay, I'm gonna uh, show some uh, little work in progress and weird experiments, and that will maybe take us to uh, uh, to the end of the talk, and then we'll have a bit of a Q and A. So um, the project I'm going to show here is from a hackathon uh, in Denmark called uh, Hack for DK or Hack Your Heritage. It's a hackathon about uh, hacking uh, cultural heritage. Um, and a lot of uh, museums and other uh, public institutions in Denmark, they just uh, take a lot of uh, data they have or a lot of archive material and then they uh, bring it to this event and then people can kind of just hack away with it. And I found a very, very beautiful data set of uh, images from uh, around 1870 um, from, um, from uh, um, the area around Culling, which is in the southern part of Jutland, where this photographer took like a, a few thousand very, very stunning uh, images of people, local people there. Um, and uh, then um, the data set also contains information about these people. So where, what were their names? Where were they born? Did they, uh, were they married? And what, uh, what job did they have? Um, but back then it was a bit expensive to have your photo photograph taken. So I, I imagine that would be a lot more people actually living uh, in that area around that time that never got their picture taken or that we don't know as much about because we don't have these uh, historical collections. So I thought it would be kind of interesting to generate new people in the same style. So I took all of these photos um, 
and trained what you call a GAN model that would then generate more or less realistic looking people in the same style. And then I took all uh, the, the data from, um, from the biographies, the text data, and then I trained an algorithm that would then generate new uh, biographies about these people. Um, the biographies ended up being a bit weird because I trained on top of a, a text model that was trained on a, lot, a large part of uh, the modern internet. So it kind of mixes old stuff with new stuff in a weird way. But uh, yeah, let's have a look. Um, so uh, once the scan model is trained, then it can generate infinite number of potential people. Um, so I picked out some and then I had this... Uh, text model try to come up with what were their names, where were they born, and what was their life story. Um, and some of it is kind of like coherent, but then sometimes it makes like weird, weird, weird mistakes. Uh, or it makes stuff that's like not logical or jumps in time, or it mixes old stuff with new stuff. Um, yeah. Um, so here you see Anne-Marie Carlsen, born in 1860 the daughter of Christen, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can just generate as many as you want. Um, so let's maybe have a look at one more. Jens Kirk. And I don't know if Rausing Gesten song actually exists. I don't think so, but it sounds very Danish. Uh, it could trick me. Um, yeah. The self-made man, yeah. Um, so if you're interested in this, you can check out more in detail on my website. Um, okay. A, another thing I'm investigating currently is a project that I call in Erasing Enhancing Essentials. And it's a project that tries to uh, kind of investigate what algorithms think, yeah, what parts of images attract the attention of people and then also the attention of algorithms. So um, based on uh, eye tracking data, uh, then uh, I used a model that if you give it an image, it will try to predict which areas will attract the gaze of a human being. Um, that sort of creates a heat map of the, of the areas that it thinks are the most interesting. And then I did two different things with those areas. I, first I masked them and then I tried to either erase them or enhance them. If I erase them, I simply in Photoshop use something called content aware fill and I erase the those uh, masked areas, the areas that uh, the algorithm thinks are the most interesting. So that could typically be people or faces, but it's also text and signs, etc. And then the results are these very cold, weird, empty looking uh, um, scenes, uh, which I kind of like. And then the opposite thing, is where you enhance it. So uh, you fill out the background with content from the core image, um, which creates these very chaotic uh, views. And um, yeah, I've been doing this uh, with a number of different uh, techniques and a lot of number of different uh, algorithms for trying to predict what is the most important thing. And you'll see some of my latest uh, experiments here. So uh, here you see an original image, and then in a few seconds, you'll see the masks uh, where it thinks what are the most interesting areas. Um, and then I enhance those areas. Uh, so fill out the background with only that, or I erase it and try to have the computer come up with what could be instead. So let's have a look at another one. So original image, the essence from the algorithm's perspective then uh, enhance the essence or erase the essence. One more here, a city scene, most interesting areas, enhance those areas or erase those areas. Then cute dogs. the most interesting areas, enhance those areas, or erase those areas. 
Uh, we'll skip the moon landing, then we'll take <laughs> this guy. Original. Most interesting areas. Enhance. And erase. Okay. The final pro project, and then I think we have time for a few questions. Um, is as little experiment I made called Perla Beats to Landscapes. Um, and uh, the idea uh, came because uh, this company called uh, NVIDIA, who makes a lot of graphic cards, but also a lot of AI experiments, um, they released a software called Gaugan. And Gaugan is this thing where you can uh, draw uh, landscapes and then it will um, kind of try to produce photorealistic landscapes that don't exist, but that match your drawing. And when you draw, you draw with specific colors that have specific meaning. So for instance, the, um, one of the colors, the top color is the sky. Um, and that is associated with the category sky. So if you, if you draw with that color up here, it should output sky in that area. Um, and then clouds, uh, hills, or what is this? I think it's rocks, uh, plants, uh, lake, river, etc. cetera, et cetera. So, and, and it's not, it's then producing a new real, more or less realistic looking, um, landscape based on these categories, which in itself is super fascinating. Um, but then what I wanted to do was try to take it out into the physical world, um, because I have two small nieces and when they come visit me, they love to play with perla beads. So I thought it would be very interesting if I could kind of translate perla beads into, uh, uh dreamy, real looking landscape. So um, in this video, you see that I produced a somewhat simple landscape with perla beads. Then I position it underneath a camera. Um, and then um, I have a software connected to the camera, some software I uh, built myself in, in uh, something called processing that will then try to isolate the colors because perla beads are kind of uh, tricky to work with from a computer vision. Uh, perspective, they shine and they have holes. So I need to kind of blur out the colors to find coherent areas of, of, um, of the same color. So you have clear, uh, skies, clear, um, clouds, clear river, grass, tree, etc. And then I take that image and then I send it to, uh, this Gaugan model, which is then able to produce a somewhat realistic looking, uh, image to, to give me back. Um, which you'll see over here. So it generated this image, which sort of looks like what I did with the Perla beads to some extent. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, if you yourself <laughs> or, you know, somebody who's interested in, in like playing with these technologies, then I'll just share two links for two, um, tool kits for doing creative stuff with machine learning. The first one is ml5js.org, which is an open source JavaScript library for doing uh, machine learning tasks. And it's, it, it's a friendly wrapper around TensorFlow JS, um, but, it, but it's way more beginner friendly. And maybe some of you are like way more advanced, so you don't need that. But if you just, if you don't have a lot of experience, then it's a very, very nice place to start. And it's also a tool that I use a lot when I teach students. Um, and it's totally free open source. And then another tool I use uh, is a tool called Runway, which is a startup, um, but that it's um, a, a service you can use where you can just have a lot of um, very, very sophisticated, uh, high-end machine learning um, models available, and you don't need to install them locally on your computer because sometimes it can actually be very tricky to get the latest uh, models up and running on your own computer if you don't have specific graphics cards and specific Python environments, but Runway kind of deals with all of that for you. So those are just some of the tools that I use. Um, okay, so I think that was my talk, and then maybe we will have uh, time for some questions. Or, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andreas. Uh, we have already quite some questions. One second. Here from Els, um, this is all very fun. But are there also examples where the techniques or tools are used for something more serious? For example, the benefit of society. 
Yes, the, so there's lots of uh, of examples for that. Um, there's a website called I think it's called ML Index where they try to keep track of all the different areas in which machine learning techniques are are implemented. So there would be lots of examples, for instance, with healthcare. So I I did things where I try to classify <laughs> whether uh, uh, an image was me, whether it was a uh, cop or whether it was an orange, but you can use similar techniques to classify whether um, uh, X-ray image contains like shows that there's a fracture or shows that there's like a cancer in a cell or not cancer in a cell. So it's similar techniques um, used in healthcare, used in production, used in all types of areas. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, Glenn is asking, could the best selling offers of the futures be algorithms? Potentially, uh, I don't see it coming in in like the next couple of years. But if you go like 10, 20 years ahead, who knows? Like the, the thing about algorithms is that they like <laughs> real human authors, they need to sleep and they they need to eat and they can only produce a limited number of uh, text at a time where if these algorithms continue to improve, like one thing is that the the quality of what they do improves, but also the quantity. Like they can, even though they don't, maybe they don't know what they're doing. Then, then if it if it reaches like a, a, a decent quality, then they can produce millions of texts. Uh, and maybe and maybe one day, like by coincidence, hit something that's really really good. But but what I've in if you if you talk about maybe closer future, then I think collaborations between human beings and algorithms could per potentially be a be best a next best selling author and there are some interesting uh, experiments where uh, real authors try to like write in collaboration with algorithms in kind of the same way that you see chess players who uses uh, chess robots they are actually quite a lot better than both uh, chess robots in, in in themselves and and human chess players so sometimes in in machine learning, you talk about this Kentawa model where the computer and the human being together is really, really powerful. This question comes from Stefano and was referring to your old images. Um, did you try to train it on a family tree or try to predict the traits of a descent? I, no, I've never tried uh, that. Um, that could be interesting. It's not something I, I have tried at all. Um, okay, um, a question from the Court of Auditors. In your experience at uh, present, what would be the best candidate technology to reverse engineer deep fakes? Yeah, so so that's uh, typically um, if you have um, models like, okay, my, my, I am not, I don't know, but, but there are lots of research in that area. So I would try to find state of the art research in that area. I, I simply don't know myself. I also don't typically like produce these algorithms i just use them so um i'm not the right person to ask uh, i don't have the answer thanks um from anna maria did you encounter any bias in the algorithms you used if so can you share some anecdotes um i think like um yeah i so i i actually um in, in some of the projects, I on purpose try to put bias into the algorithms. For instance, this project about is it funky? Like I just trained it on my own taste of uh, images, images that I thought was funky and images that I thought were boring. And in a way, it was also um, my attempt to provoke or to make the case that all algorithms are always biased. You can't really have an unbiased uh, algorithm because you can never like take all data in the world into account um so so yeah I've, um, like a lot of my work kind of tries to emphasize bias to to show people that bias exists but maybe um an example where there was a lot of bias and it wasn't like a uh, where it actually made the project not work as good as intended was maybe one of the earliest projects i showed with the face tracking and where i tried to uh, have people uh, play music via their face. Uh, I could quickly see that 
if if people were not able to hold their face straight or if there some aspects of the face were was not like in the ordinary uh, looking like my face they had a really hard time controlling it and and typically yet people who fall and is like out of the norm or out of the ordinary they are not as good uh, they don't get tracked as well so that was actually a big big issue for me it made my project even though i tried to make a project that was meant to be very very inclusive still some people could not use it if they couldn't hold their face straight for instance so that was very um yeah that was that was actually quite frustrating for me and for the participants thanks xavier is asking did you ever try to use ai systems to help you to find new ideas for creative projects um yeah i tried to uh, once with uh, some text generation models i tried to have them invent uh like products that don't exist um and i've also had students do that so if you've um so th then i could for instance just have it like uh, come up with 10 news ideas of products that don't exist and maybe some of them spark an idea or you could name a product and then it would try to describe what the product was i must say that it's mainly been for kind of fun i haven't then gone on gone on to build one of the projects but maybe someday and the last question comes from Borislav. Andreas, what is your opinion about multi-million companies using cheap labor cents per click to train AI algorithms? For example, people manually putting boundaries around an object in an image, comparing voice yeah. samples or labeling images. Yeah, so that, that's something that uh, like a lot of the times when I do uh, workshops, like this was just a presentation, but um, when I do workshops and when I try to uh, have people train uh, algorithms, then they have to do all of that manual labor. And then we typically get into discussions about like, why are some algorithms really functioning well? And why, if you try to do the same with your own manual labor, you will see that the, uh, that the um, uh, outcomes are not as good. So I, I typically, like, I don't have a, I don't, I don't necessarily have a bigger, strong opinion on it, but I try to inform people that that is how you train uh, machine learning algorithms. So I think I, yeah, I think to some extent it can be work that is sometimes you can criticize the work. Sometimes the work can be okay. I think it's hard to say whether all manual laboring is bad or good. Uh, but what I do as an educator is that I try to have students engage in conversations about it by showing them how you actually train machine learning algorithms. And the last question comes from Glenn. Uh, is China more advanced in the field? Can we see effects of its use according to countries on state systems or types of democracies? Yeah, um, I think that's, that's, that's a, it's a big, big question. I don't know whether China is more advanced uh or not i think it's also it but they are they are very advanced they're putting a lot of money into it but i don't think as an artist i am not the right person to ask whether they are state of the art whether europe or us is state of the art i, I simply don't have that knowledge um, however you could say that china is implementing it in ways that we need to be aware of and we need to criticize and i think eu like with uh, like e EU with uh, like data protection and, and and startup company culture and uh, and and implementations of machine learning, EU has a very important role to play, which I think is about like GDPR and privacy. So, um, but but whether like the state of the art of uh, EU US versus China, I'm not the right person to answer that. So uh, great! Thanks a lot for for the answers, Andreas, and thanks a lot.